Beach. From Lyman Alpha photons to operational space weather, a legacy Do of Charles A. Barth. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Larry. I, I really appreciate also, uh, as the other speakers, being invited uh, for this uh, talk and discussion today. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to go a little bit different direction here and uh, <clears throat> uh, point out a little bit of a legacy that I think uh, uh, Charles Barth has uh, contributed to toward operational space weather, which is an area that I've uh, really become involved in over the last uh, decade and a half. Um, let's see, the, uh, <clears throat> the first thing I'd like to point out is that uh, my, my experience uh, with uh, Charles Barth really has kind of helped me navigate through Pasteur's Quadrant. Uh, some of you have uh, heard of this concept. It was in a book a number of years ago, Donald Stokes. But basically, you go in four different sections, one from um, uh, uh, pure basic research and its utility, uh, taking that into the Pasteur quadrant, uh, where you have that uh, inspired basic research, uh, going down into a, another quadrant where you have the utility of it, but there's really no fundamental research going on there. And then uh, uh, probably, uh, uh, I, I hope I haven't too often I've been in this part of the domain here where the roll of the dice, but there's not much utility. There's uh, <coughs> certainly no basic science, but it <laughs> may be fun. So um, <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, I think uh, my experience uh, having started out as a Barth graduate student and also being on SME uh, years before that uh, really has helped me understand a lot of these different areas and his influence has been involved in each one of them. <coughs> So just a, a quick slide before I, I show some examples is uh, <clears throat> when I became a, a, a graduate student of, of Charles back in 1986, uh, I had been on SME from 82 to 85. I, I finished a master's and then um, uh, as many of you remember in January of 86, uh, the uh, uh, Challenger uh, uh, had uh, an last experiment on it. The, uh, Comet Halley uh, uh, instrument and uh, spacecraft. Uh, the tragedy of uh, that January uh, that we all, uh, I think, kind of remember. Uh, that uh, actually propelled me into graduate school uh, to continue my PhD. So uh, I, I realized things are going to be on hold for a while. And for the next uh, three years, uh, I was uh, involved in PhD under uh, Charles as, a, as my dissertation advisor. So uh, in February, when I started in 86, uh, he sat me down in front, uh, in front of one of the uh, color, or color CRT monitors that we had. And uh, he says, OK, and it was a precursor to one of the slides that Scott showed earlier of the global SME uh, uh, signature. And uh, he said, OK, we're going to start looking at some uh, nitric oxide. And I, I turned to him and I said, you know, Dr. Barth, I, I hate to disappoint you, but I really don't know very much about nitric oxide. I don't know how much of a help I'm going to be to you. And he kind of looks at me and says, I, I don't really care and it doesn't make any difference because it's all osmosis anyway. Just keep doing it and some of it will seep in. <laughs> so, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a line that I've used for the last decade uh, over at USC in, in teaching aerospace students there. And it seems to work very well. Um, so uh, I started doing that. And a month later in, in March, uh, we're sitting there at the terminal. And uh, we couldn't figure out how to plot something. So uh, Charles picks up the phone. And uh, lo and behold, he dials up. Dave Stern, who's sitting in the audience here. David formed uh, uh, Research Systems Inc. a couple of years earlier. And uh, so Charles is on the phone. Now, I want to make a, a dot of a plot. Tell me what the command is, Dave. So it's, I hear Dave over the phone, plot, comma, x, comma, y, comma, p sin equals 3. So this was, uh, this was indicative of uh, of uh, the, the level of detail that, that Charles would go from broad system planning, which we've seen uh, in previous talks, all the way down to the, uh, to the details of getting uh, information done correctly. Uh, so let's see. But that experience uh, in working with him as a graduate student really helped 
me get a much broader perspective because I, I really did realize the breadth of activity that he was involved in. And I'll kind of mention a little bit of that later. I, I left in 88, um, uh, graduated, uh, and um, uh, between 88 and 92 I spent uh, both uh, years at uh, NOAA Space Environment Lab under Dick Donnelly. Joanne Jocelyn is here and she remembers those days. Uh, also uh, in um, uh, Berkeley at Space Science Lab uh, in uh, the same group that Stu Boyer was at. Uh, I was there for the early 90s. Uh, Joe uh, Jello, who's in the uh, room here, he came down and recruited me to go work on Charlie Horde's uh, 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 Gal uh, Galileo uh, uh, mission of instruments uh, back in uh, the early 90s and I spent time uh, working that project uh, until uh, it finished up in uh, the beginning of the, the decade. So uh, uh, a after, um, after I left JPL, um, uh, I found myself in Northrop Grumman. Northrop had gone around buying a lot of companies back in that period. And uh, I spent a couple years with uh, uh, some intellectual property attorneys, was able to extract all my solar uh, irradiance and solar science uh, IP out of Northrop and use that to form uh, space environment technologies back in 2001 and we've been uh, uh, going since. 2009 I also took over as director or started the Space Weather Center at Utah State University. So in that, uh, that latter period, uh, in the last decade and a half, uh, it's really been a period which many people in this room know uh, is where space weather really began to evolve and mature. Back in the year 2000, we really didn't know much more other than we understood the space environment was very dynamic, uh, but we were under trying to understand much more of the applications of it to our technology. Uh, we've begun to understand that uh, a lot more over the last decade and a half. And in particular, I'll just throw you some examples at the very uh, end that I'll, I'll point to in other slides. But it's more of this Edison kind of stuff of really applying operational space weather to uh, improving conditions on life on Earth. And in particular, uh, there's a, a number of ways that this happens. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll give some examples. So uh, I won't go through a whole tutorial on space weather. Uh, I think everyone here is very familiar with it. It really is a dynamic uh, transfer of energy from the sun to the Earth. Uh, in the form of uh, the uh, photons particles and fields. And <clears throat> we all uh, recall this uh, uh, cartoon that's come out of NASA headquarters for many years, but that really is the, the view kind of early uh, decade in two, uh, 2000 of what the space environment looked like and some of the interactions. And uh, <clears throat> when you drill down to the Earth itself, uh, you realize that there's different layers of the atmosphere that that uh, we see a lot of this dynamic activity in. Uh, from my days on SME as being a controller there, I, I kind of remembered uh, some of Gary's plots on the 27-day solar variability they showed, uh, and, uh, and the, uh, Tom Woods' solar flare activity. <clears throat> so I knew that, uh, that there was things like solar proton events, uh, volcanoes, and all this stuff causes a lot of variability in our environment, some of which is modulated by uh, space weather. <coughs> There's uh, a lot of technologies that are affected by space weather. Uh, this is a very incomplete list, but some of the areas that I've had the fortune of uh, participating in over the last decade and a half. Uh, the communication side of it, of course, there's a lot of losses to communication or disruptions or uh, uh, to a lot of the frequency bands, including uh, scintillation of the signals. <coughs> Um, on the aviation side, not only is the communication and navigation problems, but there's also a radiation environment that we're beginning to understand much more. And then in satellite operations, uh, all of us know that there's LEO uh, orbit error that occurs from satellite drag. And uh, uh, those are three areas that will kind of highlight some of the work that we've evolved into in the last uh, period of time. So um, in particular, what I'd like to do is um, talk a little bit about uh, some of the radio communication stuff. Uh, over the last uh, decade, I've uh, worked a lot with uh, many colleagues in the field. Um, one of them is the group at Utah State University. Uh, Bob Shunk is there, and uh, 
<coughs> and, and they really have done a, a heroic job in understanding and characterizing the ionosphere uh, from a, a, a space weather perspective. So uh, one of the things that happens is that there's communication uh, disruptions. Uh, we saw, we, we've seen a couple examples now. The first one that really stood out was Hurricane Katrina. So back in uh, 2005, August, we remember the hurricane hitting the, the New Orleans area. Uh, that was uh, 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 a major uh, Category 5 uh, event. And uh, shortly afterwards, about uh, eight or nine days later, uh, now this was the period, by the way, when we were still all looking at the television sets, they were still lifting people off of rooftops with helicopters back in uh, the first week of September. September 7th, the fourth largest recorded flare in, in history occurs, uh, the next 20 or something. and. Uh, as uh, Murphy would have it, it was uh, while North America was on the dated side of the sun. Now, what you saw on the right-hand panel was that uh, the reports that came out from the helicopters that were ferrying people and going back and forth between the ships in the Gulf Coast uh, supporting the recovery effort, they lost complete communications, HF communications, for about uh, four or five hours during that period of time. And you remember that, <coughs> that that's a period when HF-COM was the main uh, communications method. All of the landlines had been wiped out. There was no uh, cell tower uh, uh, capability. So it really was that HF-COM capability. Uh, that was a, a major wake-up call. <coughs> then a few years later, in uh, 2011, the Great East Japan earthquake uh, occurred. On a Friday afternoon, uh, we all remember that they got hit three different ways. It was not only the earthquake, but there was the tsunami, uh, tsunami that it, uh, almost immediately followed and continued to wipe out the coastal infrastructure, particularly in the northern, northern prefectures. Um, a tremendous amount of damage and property, uh, loss of lives, <coughs> and uh, also in the infrastructure. So in going through the photos, we found this uh, example of an unused cell phone tower. And this is what happens in, in these major uh, disaster uh, regions, is that you really lose the entire infrastructure. So HF communications becomes uh, extremely important. Uh, at Utah State, we were contacted by Japanese colleagues on uh, that Friday afternoon and asked if we could provide any kind of estimate for the uh, HF communication availability for the near vertical instant skyway between Tokyo and the northern prefectures. You notice you can't get direct line of sight because there's mountains there. So uh, by Sunday we were able to stand up a capability and, uh, and that's now continued uh, 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 in that community for a, a number of years. Uh, it's those kind of uh, uh, plots that we gave them, we gave them a three hour forecast uh, for HF <coughs> frequencies that were available for the emergency responders, uh, not only for in Japan itself on the on the lower uh, panel here, but also globally at different frequencies, as you can see on the top, top panel. <coughs> so, <coughs> I'd like to kind of move on to the aviation side of things. And one of the things here is that. Um, uh, I think we've all come to realize that there's three major areas in which space weather affects aviation. Uh, the radiation environment on the left panel. In the center panel is the HF communications. Uh, after 9-11, any aircraft coming in and out of the U.S. has to guarantee that they have communication capability. So below 70 degrees north latitude or south, uh, they're able to use uh, the regular uh, air uh, or traffic management system. Above that uh, latitude, what they have to do is they have to use HF communications. And that can be uh, uh, disrupted. So HF comm, and then the, the third area, of course, is the WAS uh, navigation. Uh, this shows an event, I, I can't even read the, the date on it, but, but basically uh, the landing uh, facilities across the North America are really governed by uh, the accuracy in, in automated systems and how you can bring aircraft in. So the WAS system is a, another uh, area that's, that can be disrupted by space weather. <coughs> on the radiation side, and I'll just go, go through a couple slides on this, we've been very active at SET 
in this in the last uh, uh, six or uh, seven years. Um, the left-hand panel kind of shows the cartoon of the radiation environment. Basically, it's uh, galactic cosmic rays as the background and solar energetic protons as the uh, events that occur on top of that. And all of those affect the radiation environment that we feel in an in airplane as, as air crew members or as uh, passengers or, or uh, whatever. So if you're flying for 10 hours, if you go from Denver to Frankfurt, uh, that's about a 10 hour flight. Uh, that, uh, that flight will give you a, an about equivalent of a one chest x-ray. That's at 37,000 feet. Uh, if you fly during that same route and there's a, uh, a solar flare with a lot of protons that come off of it, you can start multiplying that by two uh, up to uh, five or six or even larger amount uh, for the uh, massive flares and and that radiation environment then is what uh, what we end up feel as, as passengers. Okay, so Larry's asked me to finish up here. Uh, there's a global system called NIRAS that uh, NASA Langley has developed that we're working with. And generally what we're doing is we're, we're providing a capability now to use total ionizing dose measurements on aircraft. We measure it on the aircraft. There's our first uh, unit uh, on a DC-8 that's flying right now over Iceland. Uh, we've had 50 flights of that so far. <clears throat> and uh, we send it out through an Iridium uh, link on top. It's processed on the ground and then uh, eventually will go to air traffic management in a decade. Uh, website on it. But uh, uh, example, one of the flights. We have a modest fleet of four of these flying now. This is uh, our uh, unit, our smaller unit now on the NOAA Gulfstream 4 and the NSF Gulfstream 5. <laughs> And uh, we have on the reconverted U-2 spy planes over at Edwards Air Force Base, we just now de delivered this unit, our Flight Module 3, and that will be flying up to uh, 60 to 70,000 feet starting in about a month. Uh, with um, Alan's uh, efforts for the Worldview, uh, where we've got an MOU between SET and, M uh, and Worldview to do uh, our Flight Module 4 on that for stratospheric balloons. And then this September at the National Business Aviation Association will be uh, providing an a iPhone size uh, a dosimeter for the business jet community. So all of these are providing real-time dose measurements that can be brought down to the ground. I won't go into all the details on satellite orbit stuff. Uh, on SET we've had a long history of working with Space Command uh, to develop a capability uh, to uh, provide greatly improved thermospheric densities for satellite operations. Uh, and we, we've been providing for uh, Space Command over at Vandenberg in the JSPO, uh, Joint Space Operations Center, a capability for uh, uh, the forecast of solar and geomagnetic activity uh, indices uh, over the next uh, 144 hours uh, that they use in operations. They actually move the space station uh, once a month approximately based on these data. We've had to develop uh, not only the solar radiance, but geomagnetic uh, activity as uh, shown by these uh, CME events. And we use redundant systems, with both NMIL uh, and a RICE, a DST, as well as our own homegrown uh, data-driven and a Momilos uh, DST as well. So <clears throat> the final thing I'll just mention is that uh, there's been a lot of milestones in operational space weather. Uh, currently in the U.S., all major agencies uh, have space weather activities. Uh, Bob McCoy is in the audience and he has uh, certainly been active in that area and helped develop many of those over the years. The American Commercial Space Weather Association uh, formed in 2010 and now has 20 companies in it. Uh, all of these are small companies that are involved in space weather. Space Weather Journal is 15 years old. It's a major publication. Right now, this month, uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House is doing a major planning session on space weather risk mitigation for all areas of agencies. Uh, they're in a comment period for 30 days. To, so uh, if you have any comments on their swarm activity, please feel free to answer them. And basically, I think the summary is that we've really seen space weather activity over the last 15 years move from a an effort of trying to understand the science of what's going on to now beginning to utilize that science 
to improve life on her, uh, particularly in the uh, aspect of uh, uh, helping manage uh, risk from uh, space weather for a lot of different industries. So thank you, Kent. Uh, any questions or comments? <laughs> so, uh, you know, what's the next stage in space weather? Uh, right now, space weather is, is still a, a niche area in terms of commercial activity. Uh, our goal in this second decade was to have begun penetration into uh, a lot of broad industries. I think that's actually progressing at this point in time. Um, and I think over the next decade, what we really expect to see is a completion or a, a, an extension, expansion of that risk management capability in a lot of broad uh, industry sectors. So I think uh, uh, that activity is uh, uh, underway right now. The stuff going on at the White House with their uh, a, uh, agency planning is a, a great example of this. The uh, AMS has its Space Weather Symposium every, every year. Of course, AGU Space Weather Week as well. So. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Dan, did you have a question? Well, no, I just uh, I had looked at the um, National Space Weather Strategy that you were mentioning and uh, have some concerns about it, but I wondered what your reaction to it as a, as a national strategy. Uh, thank you, Dan. And I'm going to give you $5 afterwards for asking that question because I, I think, um, uh, yeah. We've taken a look at it too. Uh, in fact, I just got done reading the thing again uh, in the last couple of days. Um, <clears throat> I feel like, uh, this is my, my personal view, but uh, I feel like uh, it's, a, it's a good first step in bringing awareness at, at the highest levels of the government. I, thought, I think that's excellent. Um, I think it's lacking in some other areas, particularly uh, it's really focused mainly on the agencies, which is only one of three pillars in this space weather enterprise. Uh, academia and commercial activities are still not well uh, referenced in there. And uh, in fact, what we're doing on the part of uh, AXWA is we're um, recommending that they start, basically it's a, it's a uh, an, an economic innovation zone. It'd be like a hub zone or something or a, a special economic zone. Uh, but this economic zone would be primarily for both academic and commercial entities. And one of the things that it would do is it would actually mandate agencies to make purchases or uh, procure their capabilities for a lot of these areas from either a, uh, academic or commercial U.S. Uh, sectors as opposed to try and redevelop stuff in labs. So we're making a major push to try and add to or change a little bit of the direction of that document. Yeah, to me it was disappointing that, that uh, something like a year-long effort led to so little new insight into real strategic activity. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Good.